Hello everyone, welcome back to another video on the fundamentals of control systems. Today's topic is the modeling of dynamic systems. This is Endless Engineering, I'm Gus, so let's dive right in. In today's video, we're going to talk about modeling of dynamical systems. Before we start, I want to talk about why this is important. And the reason is, as I introduced in the first lecture video, that to control a system, we need to understand how that system works and what happens to the system given a certain input, what the output is that is observed. So to do that, we need to understand modeling to a certain degree. And I'm not going to turn this lecture series into a bunch of modeling videos. So that's why I've chosen to do modeling by example. And that's what we're going to be doing. Today, our first example is a DC motor. DC motors have become fairly ubiquitous everywhere. They're in cars, they drive cars, they're in electrical, uh, electromechanical settings in the industry and in industrial um, settings. Uh, they're in your home right now, whether you have a garage door that uses a DC motor or uh, your kid has toys that have motors in them that drive them. So fair to say that it's an important thing to learn about. I have a little diagram here, it's a mock-up of a brushed DC motor. It's like the simplest DC motor you could ever see. But it'll sh I'll show you how using this simple illustration, we can come up with a model that's uh, of sufficient fidelity. And that's the key here. Typically models, the higher fidelity they go, the more complicated they get. And that's not necessarily always a good thing. Let's talk about this. Typically in a DC motor, you have a stator, which is essentially a magnet that's stationary that provides an electromagnetic field. And you have an armature, which is a coil connected to a uh, rotating commutator ring. And there is a power supply that's given here that runs a current through that armature. Now, when that armature has current inside of it, according to uh, Lorenz law, you have an electromagnetic field with a current flowing right through it. The, that induces a force on that uh, armature coil and then it allows it to start rotating and then you get torque and rotational speed now that then what happens is also the motion itself of a coil inside an electromagnetic field generates a back emf which is i have here bb that back emf is important as well because it dictates the operation of the motor right so, okay, this is great. This is a nice simplistic illustration of how a DC motor works. How do I model it? To make a model, you have to make certain assumptions. And these assumptions can make or break your model. So you have to be really smart on what assumptions you make. And you also have to live with the consequences. So you might lose some fidelity, but you'll live with it because it allows you to do certain things. Like, it'll be good in computation, like fast to compute and things like that. First assumption I'm going to make, you can see here that I've started by making my uh, power source, the armature voltage, as this figure here, or the symbol. This symbol typically, if you've taken any classes in circuit analysis or circuit engineering, you know that this represents a voltage source. Right? So I'm going to draw the circuit here using idealized components. So my, my current, my, uh, my armature has a resistance. That coil, when current flows through it, it has resistance. And that resistance is here as an idealized element. It also has capacitance. And every coil will have capacitance. Again, these are assumptions that these are idealized components that when put together, they model that armature. And here is where the commutator ring is, draw it like this, which gives you the back EMF. Right, so we have the armature voltage, the back EMF, the capacitance, and the resistance, and I have the current in the armature which flows from positive to negative, right? Okay, great. So now I have a circuit. What do I do with it? As we used these idealized components, we can start to translate them into a little bit of mathematics. Now we know from physics that the torque generated in the motor is proportional to the current in the armature. We also know that the back EMF is proportional to the 
speed of the motor, which I'm going to call omega, this rotational speed. And let's give those constants some subscripts so we can know that this is the back EMF and that's the torque constant. Okay, great. What else do I know? I know that the voltages across a resistance, right, and a capacitance, I know the equations for, for Ohm's law, we know the voltage across this, and we know the voltage across the capacitance as well from physics. So we know that the voltage due to the capacitance is going to be equal to the capacitance times the derivative of the current that goes through it. And we know that from Ohm's law, the voltage across the resistance of the armature is equal to I times R, right? I is the current in the armature and R is the um, resistance of the coil. Great. So again, these are fundamental physics concepts. How do I use them to model how the system changes over time? Well, my first equation is derived through Kirchhoff's voltage law, where I know that the summation of voltages in a loop is equal to zero, right? So I know that I have the voltage across the resistance, which is IA times RA from this equation. And I know that I have the voltage across the capacitance, which is L times derivative of IA by DT. Let me continue down here. And I know that I also have the voltage in the back EMF. And I also know that I have a minus, because this is the power source itself, the voltage in the armature, right? So that's my first equation. If I rearrange that, I can write it as IA dot is equal to the voltage in the armature minus voltage in the back EMF minus IA RA divided by the capacitance. And I dot here, this dot represents the operator which is the derivative over time. So if I say something dot, that means D by DT, right? So here's my first equation that tells me how my uh, current changes over time in the system. We say, okay, great. So I know that how the current changes over time. How does that help me with the motion of the motor, right? That's a fair question. So typically for a motor, we put a shaft here and then there is something that's like a disc here. I'm gonna call this J for a second. So this is my mechanical load, right? This is a shaft. And let's take, for example, a car. Let's take an example of like a, a small RC car that you have. If you take that apart, you'll see the motor, which is all of this. And you'll see a small shaft where the wheel of that RC car has been connected. So this disc has a mass moment of inertia, J, which is distribution of the mass around its um, center, right? And I know that there is a torque here, right? This is the torque in the motor, tau, which is this guy. This is going to be moving. And there's an omega, there's a speed. Uh, so I know that this is also going to move. Uh, this is also going to have some torque here, which is the motor torque, right? And it's going to be moving in the direction of that torque. So it's going to have a some acceleration, right? Let's call it theta double dot, which is essentially omega dot, which is alpha. I'll talk about what those are. Again, dot is the derivative with respect to time. But also, I have friction, right? Because my, my shaft is rotating, there's a friction that's counteracting this motion. Now, friction can be model in, modeled in multiple different ways. One model, which is simple yet effective, is the Coulomb friction. And that states that the friction itself is proportional to the speed at which the thing that has friction is moving. In this case, let's say that the constant proportional constant B multiplied by omega, or, you know, theta dot, and that gives me my friction torque, right? So great, now I know everything that's working on this shaft, what do I do with it? I can draw a free body diagram of the shaft. This is my motor end that has the torque of the motor. The disc is here, I've removed the disc, 
but I know that this disk will move at j theta double dot, right? And I know that there is a friction of b theta dot, right? So to model this, I use Newton's second law, wherein the summation of torques on the system is equal to j times alpha, which is the rotational acceleration. j is the moment of inertia, mass moment of inertia. So I get j times theta double dot. Now, let's continue here. What are the torques on the system? There's the torque from the motor. That's positive in sign because it's moving, it's causing the motion and the motion is with it. Minus the counteractive torque, which is the friction, right? So rearranging this, we get j um, theta double dot plus b theta dot is equal to the torque in the motor. Now we also know the torque in the motor is equal to the proportional constant times the armature current, right? So this is my second equation. And in my first equation, I know that my back EMF is equal to K, the proportional for the back EMF, times omega or theta dot. I'm sorry that I'm mixing things here, but let's go over it one more time. I'm mixing the thetas and the omegas and all these things. Let's go over it one more time so we can have a clear idea of what all this mathematics means. So we have a DC motor um, circuit here, which has capacitance and resistance and the power source. And due to the power source, the armature voltage generates a current in the armature, which causes it to rotate due to the magnetic flux. That rotation has a angle theta or a velocity theta dot, which is the derivative of the angle or omega. And that rotation generates a torque. Now, if I put a shaft over there, that torque is going to be transmitted by that shaft. And here we're making the assumption that the shaft is rigid. And the, the rotation of the shaft is going to rotate the disc J here, which has a mass moment of inertia. This could be a wheel, this could be whatever type of load that you have. And I know that from a mechanical system standpoint, if I apply a torque and there is a uh, mass here, there's also going to be friction in the system. In this case, it's a brushed DC motor, so it's friction in the brushes and bearings and things like that. So there's a reactive torque B theta dot or B omega, which is a Coulomb model of friction. Again, multiple ways to model friction, another assumption here. So I can write down the two equations that govern the change in current over time in the armature and the change of uh, the velocity over time. And these are two differential equations that show me that if I apply a armature voltage on the DC motor, then I can get some changing in the current. And this changing in the current over time with the torque in the motor drives the shaft. And that shaft in turn moves the disc. Now you could become you know, fancy and you would like to have more fidelity. You can say, oh, this shaft that we talked about is elastic. So when I apply a torque here in the beginning, it's not going to directly move the uh, load. It's going to twist a little bit. And there's that one more degree of freedom of motion. And you can model that. Typically, that's necessary when the shaft is long and it's made of certain materials and things like that. In this case, we're going to keep it simple just to illustrate that we made an assumption. If this assumption um, were applied to a system that actually has twist that's non-negligible, then we'd have to go back and refine our model because our description of the system itself is inaccurate. Right? So there you have it. We've derived the model for the DC motor as a dynamical system that changes over time. If you've enjoyed this video and you'd like to see some more of this endless engineering, make sure you subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell. That way YouTube will notify you every time we roll out a new video. Thank you for watching.